Maria, how are you? Nice to see you both. Uh, excellent, excellent. You too, of course. It's been a while. Uh, I'd just like to introduce this Hangout this afternoon. I think it's going to be very exciting. We've got a lot of very interesting things to talk about. I know quite a few of our friends are watching, so we don't really need to introduce ourselves, but I know there are maybe some other people who okay. may not know us. So I'll start by introducing ourselves. I'm Simon, and this is Maria. And we live in Brazil, Sao Paulo, and we're the co-authors of this book, Colonomics, Business Where People and Planet Matter. I don't know if you're seeing it back to front or not. And um, so, Gunter, I sometimes introduce you as a visionary entrepreneur, but I know that you're quite, you yourself say you're quite difficult to describe, so could you just do a very quick introduction? Gosh. Uh... <clears throat> I guess uh, the, the short equivalent to describe what I do is I help improve information systems through three areas, uh, innovation, technology, specifically data and content, but other things, um, and then applied uses for them um, through different builds and product builds. Uh, so I currently have uh, three companies. Um, one is Favio, which is based in Lausanne, Switzerland, and we uh, do what we describe social web intelligence, and I can get into that later if it's appropriate or not. Uh, Lumen, which we just formed, uh, which is a, a tried and true social innovation company, which we will talk about. And then uh, Code Monkeys, uh, which is a company I've had for about a year now with a few friends, um, and we're doing large sort of enterprise and large content builds. Uh, you know, Revolt TV in LA is one of, one of our clients, and we do work Microsoft and Verizon and some other big companies. So uh, those are the spaces I play. Fantastic. And it's been a while since we had our last hangout. It, it um, has on, been. Hang <laughs> on the last hangout, we did talk a lot about holonomics, so we're not going to talk too much about that, but we're going to have quite a holonomic conversation. Good. Um, just so people know what the plan is, we're going to talk a little bit about what we got up to in the UK this, this Christmas and New Year. We're going to talk a little bit about art, narration, meaning. Um, over Christmas, I saw you posting some excellent artwork of your own, so I'd love to hear a little bit about that and <laughs> your, what you were trying to convey with the archetypes. And then also, as we said, hopefully this will then provide a very interesting doorway into some of your more, more recent ventures, what led up to it, and how we can really make sense of where we need to go in terms of transforming businesses, transforming organizations, and transforming whole industries and uh, people and society. How does that sound? That sounds chock full of good stuff. <laughs> so as I said, Maria and I, we're in, I actually just need to take one of these earplugs out. Um, I can't quite hear myself. Sure. <laughs> it's, it's too good. What we did, um, we live in Brazil, but we went back to the UK this Christmas, you know, to see friends, to stay with my family. But also, at the same time, we really took the opportunity to see some very amazing artwork, a lot of different types of artwork. Um, I'm from the, I don't know if you know Dumfries in Galloway, sure. where, I'm from. Where, I, where I'm from, not so many people have been to. It's the southwest of Scotland. Mm. It's very rural. Um, not many people there, but there is some amazing artwork there, such as the artwork of Andy Goldsworthy, who does installations in the middle of nowhere. But this artwork, it really fits in with the context of that particular landscape. Um, it's not so easy to access, you know, literally find. You have to sometimes know what you're... You have to explore it. Yeah, yeah. this is the whole experience, though. It's yeah. not just seeing the artwork. Okay. It's the whole finding it, really being at one with nature, understanding how the ancient or the old crafts people used to live. And a lot of the artwork honours this concept of craft. Absolutely wonderful. Um, and on top of that, we did go to a few art galleries. And one art gallery I'd love to mention particularly is the Kelvin Grove in Glasgow. Mm. Maria's going to talk about the Kelvin Grove as a whole, but there's one piece of art, Gunter, that absolutely blew me away. Now, I do have, I don't know if you can see this, I'm probably showing you, I know there's um, maybe a little bit of glare. It's called The Druids 
bringing in the mistletoe. Mm. And I've got photographs on my blog. After this hangout, I'll post links, um, all the various links that we talk about. But this particular piece of artwork, <laughs> it was um, signed by two different artists, George Henry and Edward Hornell. And they were part of a collective called um, the Glasgow Boys. And they were at their creative peak at the end of the 19th century. So we're talking about 1870 to 1890. And they were some of the most innovative, creating, creative, and all shocking, at times shocking artists. Because in terms of the status quo, you had the Royal um, Academy in Edinburgh. And a lot of this artwork, it was sentimental. It was about great historical scenes. Mm. But the Glasgow boys, they had a different vision. They wanted to break out of kind of the high society in Scotland. They were quite spiritual. They had many different, different influences. And I think at, at their peak, with this particular piece, um, you don't normally see druids drawn in this manner, so colourful. And also the perspective was shocking. They, they're walking down a hill um, with two cows that are carrying the mistletoe. And of course, mistletoe, it's both a mystical plant for the Druids and healing as well. And I think one of the things that was most shocking for people when it went on view, also in Germany as well as in Europe, that they used gold leaf to really highlight the most important and spiritual characters in the painting. Yeah. And I just stood there, and for me, it was absolutely incredible, this piece. I can't tell you the impact it had on me. The, the original is maybe four foot square, yeah. and it was really dramatic. Um, I, for one, I, I'm not, I hadn't really explored the works of the Glasgow Boys before, but just seeing this piece, and there was also a short video you could watch explaining it, absolutely incredible. And this was just one part of our experience of the Kelvin Grove. And I know, Maria, you really want to talk about the Kelvin Grove Museum yeah, as a whole. Yeah, I was really impressed with it because the Kelvin Grove is a whole experience inside the museum. The whole building is incredible, full of galleries, different, uh, different ways that you can go explore. Away, yeah. explore. And uh, it's it's a uh, experience for all senses because at the same time you are seeing exhibitions, there are presentations, music presentations, and uh, the way the curator, the curators uh, uh, show the the exhibitions uh, takes you in a journey. is incredible, and the way they use the language to yeah. explain each piece of art is yeah. very. Commu how can I say communicative. It? communicative because yeah. it's not a academic. It's not pretentious. Yeah, it's not you know? academic. So you really feel the picture. You you really feel the story of the artists, and uh, it was really interesting because at some point they announced it that there would be a a music interactive music there in the museum of Scottish folk music <laughs> in one of the galleries. So there you are. Um, it, this particular gallery was called the Gallery of Scottish Nationality, and there were some very huge paintings which uh, reflect the history of Scotland. And there, there were two Scottish folk musicians playing music, but you could pick up a drum, pick up a tambourine, join in. And sit on know. the floor, and it yeah. was a very amazing experience because uh, uh, surrounding us, all the, these very nice pictures, and we playing to get with the other uh, musicians and uh, uh, other point that is very interesting is the interactive uh, way they they built the some galleries yeah so you yeah. can explore colors you can explore why the artist painting that way not in not uh, other way so it's for the whole family and uh, another point very interesting because you are free there. Yeah, yeah, this is something you really noticed. Yeah, because I didn't see anybody Security guards. Security, so, so, uh, how can it's I very say? very discreet. Yeah, very discreet. Yeah. So, very amazing experience. And the, the, the point of the language, yeah. how they were able to, to communicate yeah. art with everybody, child. Yeah. 
asking questions. It wasn't, sometimes in art galleries, I don't know if you find this, Gunter, it's very pretentious, the description of a piece of art. And the description sometimes for me is not accessible yeah. because I'm not a great art historian or academic. Expert. But I think, you know, you and I, we talk about the customer experience a lot. And I really feel that the curators of the Kelvin Grove, they really sat down and thought, what is the what is the experience of a visitor? Yeah. And even they've thought about the height of children because some of the pieces of art, they're at a much lower level. So that children, you know, children don't just look up. Children can explore those particular things. In, in their levels. At their level, yeah. It's a very, how can I say, very... Um, Respectful. Yeah, it's respectful because also yeah. the curators in their descriptions, they they don't patronise you. They ask questions. They have they say, oh, have you noticed this? What do you think the artist was trying to convey here? Isn't it interesting that whereas in the previous painting yeah. this? And why do you think he, it? It was use, he used a green mm -hmm. and not yellow? Yeah. If they use the yellow, what do you think he could be communicating? Yeah. So, wow. so I, I mean, I know a lot of what we do, it's all about online, internet-based, but yeah, I think yeah. for us, we had this great experience uh, over Christmas of yeah. visiting many different places, <laughs> and it's the curators who are really telling a story um, across the whole exhibition. Mm -hmm. And this, for us, it, it's a very inspirational a, a customer it's experience a, a takes a little experience. bit away. Yeah, it's a lived experience. Yeah. Very, it has a huge impact on you. And it's it was a great inspiration for some of the ideas that we've now had. Yeah. I don't know what your experience has been, Gunter, of like really good art well, galleries. I mean, historically, you're talking about a period, a demiurgic period uh, in history that's quite pivotal in terms of you know, getting to what Husserl eventually described as phenomenological uh, approaches to uh, communications and artistic expression. I mean, you mentioned the Druids. I don't know how familiar you are, people are in general, with the esoteric knowledge and Gnosticism. Uh, but the Druids, like many other groups, uh, were born out of different periods of time, Lutheranism, re uh, Reformation periods, Enlightenment periods. Uh, and they were essentially societies of people, secret societies, if you will, that had a very, very advanced esoteric knowledge about the universe. Um, and in fact, the knowledge that they accumulated and, uh, and, and you know, built upon, if you will, uh, really served as a control mechanism for uh, monarchical systems going forward, uh, among other things. It was, a, it was a, a system for control, essentially. But within it, um, there was so much um, expression flowing out of what they knew that it, in a way they almost couldn't contain it. So if, if you look at um, what they borrowed from, everything from, you know, different types of, uh, you know, sacred geometries to, uh, you know, Zoroastrianism, you know, which is where Nietzsche eventually went, uh, you know, built a lot of his philosophical thinking upon that, which is, of course, uh, you know, ancient Iranian uh, uh, philosophies. Uh, these are all pre-Christian. These are all pre-Christian knowledge uh, bases. So mm -hmm. it's very interesting when you look at esoteric knowledge at its core, particularly as as the core functions of color, sound, and vibration are involved. How mm -hmm. they were trying, essentially, the Druids were trying to uh, uh, translate, if you will, those expressions into uh, a normative three-dimensional realm, and it was actually quite difficult. And which I think shocking about it to the observer, at least to people back then, and probably perhaps now, so, you know, like all of us, was all the perceptible disconnects with syntax and with sound and with vision and visual cues that occur when you look at these pieces. Yeah. And it's interesting that we are just now, um, you know, using different types of experience design, you know, such as in inside of the Smithsonian where you actually can almost bring out extrasensory um, responses in people when they're interacting with art. And I, I, think it go, I think it also lends to this idea that we can also shift away from purely digital systems or purely analog systems to sort of these more integrated things. And I'm not talking about singularity. I'm just talking about sense making in a way that is far more human uh, and far more exploratory such that it reframes our views of the world. 
and and I think that's really really important. It's critical, in fact, um, especially given uh, that we're in a state of, of intense information overload. But really, we're, we are we have been dulled from a sensory perspective quite quite significantly, I think, um, to the extent where there's almost a codependency on programmatic forms of information sharing and um, and belief systems and, and all of that stuff. So, what you're talking about, both historically and in present day, is is a very, very, I think, a very, very important intersection for exploration. <clears throat> Absolutely, and I think one of one of the other things I look at is this just concept of co-creation. Co-creation, it's a very big word, a buzzword nowadays. <clears throat> But people, I think in the Druids, what really impresses me is this is a co-creative act of two artists who managed to just, in this single painting, create something they that together. they painted together. And it's a very authentic whole. And they do mm -hmm. capture this, something they've captured about Druids, which is absolutely captivating for the person looking at the painting. And I really feel this is something that, you know, I talk about, and we talk about a lot, is ego. And you cannot be innovative. You cannot do real, genuine co-creation if you're stuck in ego. And I think the beautiful thing about the Glasgow Boys as a collective, I don't detect too much competition. I think they were really wanted to, to break, share, yeah, yeah, to share, to co-create, to break out of it's existing. To, to contemplate thoughts. things together. Yeah, they're very contemplative. I, I think I like a, a lot the word contemplation. I think it's very profound and very important. And we lost the ability in <coughs> our day by day to contemplate life, to contemplate things. I think one thing that impressed me in in the museum was exactly that you are. You are contemplating all the time, and uh, you are free to do that. So the whole experience it teaches you all the time. So I, I was thinking, why our lives in organizations and in our yeah, day by day uh, lives are not uh, like that? It's so possible. You you have this. All these feelings happening, and they really uh, make your spirit stronger, and you you elevate your your soul. You are in another other level yeah. of things. So contemplation, I think, it, for me, the word contemplation that what we, we do in a museum and seeing a very nice picture like the Druids one is something that we should uh, bring more or to remember, yeah, in our lives. Yeah, it's, um, well, so on the, on the, through the lens of co-creation and collaboration, which are distinctly different things, as you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, we have some very interesting nuances in terms of forms of contemplation. So, for example, in scenarios where I've co-created things, uh, either web objects or artistic mm -hmm. objects or experiences, um, you know, the, the functional dynamics are very intense. They're, you're, you're butting up against inherent belief systems. You're butting up against uh, emotional um, uh, dynamics with, resident within the individual that come out in a group setting. You're dealing with um, all sorts of, of, of interactions that, from a, percep from a perception standpoint, um, challenge the, the individual to think about what he or she is actually participating in. Then, then you get to the collaboration side, and that's a whole nother ball of wax because um, it's it's one thing to say, well, we're going to go create this thing without a sense of purpose, or we're going to just see what happens, what emerges out of it, which is always wonderful, right? And then collaboration tends to fall into the bucket of what purpose are we creating something, right? Mm -hmm. And that that's there's a stigma that goes in immediately by default as to how the collaboration will manifest and what the outcomes are going to be and if and everybody has value alignment. And I would say, and, and, and I, I don't want to make sweeping generalizations, but in a co-creative situation where you don't have any of those pressures, um, value just emerges. In a collaborative environment where there is a an intended purpose, even if 
that there's often no value alignment or it's very murky or it's not quite discernible or people just don't have the, uh, the bandwidth or the wherewithal necessarily to let things emerge. Uh, because again, this kind of boils comes back to our relationships with control and ego. I think on the subject of ego, I look at ego <clears throat> as a as, as a filter. Uh, ego is not good. It's not bad. It's something that you manage in the in the world that we live in, which is a 3D world. Um, you know, ego has a place. It's a navigational tool. So. You know, it's not so much that you do away with ego or you suppress ego, you challenge it. You, you use it for what it is. And then the eco parts of, of, the, of, the, of the mind and the body and the soul, the, 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 the whole self, are what help manage that process and elucidate an, an experience through contemplation for an individual and a group such that values can align and they can emerge and they can be built upon. And as we've talked about many times, and I, I talk about a lot with my colleagues, is we're really looking at fundamental differences between reductionist approaches to life and creation versus emergent approaches. Um, mm -hmm. And again, this is not, not to ascribe good, bad, right, wrong, or, uh, or, or even indifferent to them, but more or less to say if the world has been set up primarily through reductionist uh, approaches to everything, then how do we find a happy me a medium with emergent approaches and, ha and more importantly how do we get people to contemplate differently let alone contemplate at all but, but contemplate differently about themselves in a, in a physical or a virtual environment and those are the critical questions I would think yeah, yeah. so yeah what, what we'd like to do is um, we're going to move the conversation on and talk a little bit about what you know we've all been doing in terms of co-creating, um, creating together, and your particular initiatives. But one thing um, I do want to, to mention just before your piece of news, and it's a very amazing piece of news, is we have a little bit of news that um, was announced yesterday. So um, Sustainable Brands, um, our friends at Sustainable Brands announced their list of the top 36 books in sustainability. Wow. And we're very proud to announce that Holonomics was chosen as one of their top 36 books. So, Otty Maria well, and I would really like to, we'd really like to thank all our friends at Sustainable Brands. But for me, this wouldn't have happened without many, many, very many genuine friends and many people that you know we haven't yet met um, who've, like yourself, have really supported. Um, the the developments and the communication of what we're trying to achieve with holonomics of helping people think in different ways. So I've got a little bit of a list here. I just wanted to mention a few friends who yeah. I think really helped yeah. in the initial stages. There's um, our friend Martin from the company Buha in Argentina, uh, Jennifer Sertle, who I know you know, our great friend Betsy Merkel, who's doing wonderful things with the iOpen network, uh, John Keldon doing amazing work on dialogue, Peter van der Awera, who's doing great work in um, currencies, cryptocurrencies, the you know, the financial markets, he's been a supporter. In Brazil, Instituto Jatabas, who are helping us develop and bring, introduce holonomics to a much wider audience. And also our friends Daniela and Zoraich, who are doing some great work in Brazil with their um, network, Empower Women, really helping women from all parts of Brazilian society develop um, entrepreneurially. And also um, our great friend, Omero Santos, who's a great, who did a huge amount of work in sustainability in Brazil um, for many, many years before anyone else was really talking about sustainability. You know, he, he's been championing holonomics, so we're really grateful for that. Um, so that's our little piece of news. Um, that's you know, wonderful. I wanted to <laughs> mention that. But obviously, Bravo. You, <laughs> but I know you've got um, you've been doing some really amazing new work. But just before talking about that, um, over the Christmas, you were, I don't, I'm not too sure if you were painting over Christmas or if you showed some of your artwork over Christmas. We've been talking about art, and one thing, one great question. 
I had for you is a lot of your recent artwork that you showed was very archetypal. So before talking about Lumen, I was just wondering, are these recent pieces of artwork, and what do you, what were you hoping to communicate, and what, mm. what did you uh, discover about yourself in your creative process of painting? Uh, that's a great question. I um, I my early training was in art. Um, in fact, I was supposed to go. I got a scholarship to RISD and the Chicago uh, Art Institute, coming out of high school. And I was fortunate enough to go to a, a, a preparatory school where I actually majored in art. And um, it was wonderful training. Um, I, over the years, sort of became disassociated from it for various different reasons. Um, probably my priorities were not uh, the best. I was chasing money around and doing all sorts of stupid stuff. But um, I, after I got my divorce about four years ago, um, my fiance now, Mira, um, you know, really, <clears throat> excuse me, really encouraged me to, to to start drawing and painting again. And I was kind of going through some pretty significant transformations in life. And I had a, I cheated death a couple times in my life, and I kind of ignored a couple of the experiences. And I had other stuff that I won't talk about now because it's, it probably warrants a few other conversations. <laughs> but, <laughs> but needless to say, um, I really connected with my own spirituality very, very deeply um, and decided that I was going to utilize the talents I had been given, God-given if you want to call it that, um, to really apply them to the areas of information and communications that I'm passionate about, particularly technology and, co and, and storytelling and content and whatnot. And so the archetypal stuff that you've identified in that is, is very much that. It's, they are uh, sort of uh, socio-religious and socio-cultural archetypes, often misunderstood. Um, I, I am a Gnostic, uh, <clears throat> not agnostic. I am agnostic as well, but I am a, I have a Gnostic viewpoint, if you want to call it that. I, I like to say I don't have a worldview. I, I don't think I do, but my leanings are Gnostic, <clears throat> which means a lot of things. Um, and, a lot, and a lot of Gnosticism is very, very misunderstood. But it does involve the esoteric knowledge, and so the explorations that I've been undertaking uh, with the art have been largely around archetypes and evolving my own self and the way I relate to um, masculine and feminine energies, the way I relate to other people differently, how, how to open up my communications, my emotional dynamics, and all those things. And of course, art is a wonderful expression for that, and it's a great release for me because my mind is always turning. I, I don't sleep very much. Um, I haven't in a long time. I'm, probably get about four hours on average a night. I'm trying to change that. but So the art is a good release. It's a calming of the mind. It's very meditative for me. And then the archetypal explorations in and of themselves are interesting because what I'm starting to do now is take pieces out of that process and apply it into experience design on the innovation side. So to be more specific, when you know we get into a room with people or, or a physical space, how can archetypal dynamics approach differently lend to different types of human interactions and what do you see in those interactions, what emerges, and then um, in, and also in how I build technologies, like um, like uh, even in, in applying, doing applied data approaches or how we tag things or how we write algorithms emergently. So it's, it all it all factors in in a, in a certain way and some of it's more crude, some of it's more refined, it just kind of depends, but that was going on. So the, the paintings that you saw, the drawings were we're, we're an amalgam of things I've done over the last maybe 18 to 24 months. Um, and then I've been drawing and painting with more regularity <clears throat> now as just part of my, I guess, meditation, part of my uh, unwinding process, for lack of a better way of putting it. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. So you've had this very deep, all these deep experiences over the last few years. Um, what we're building up to now, you, you made a fantastic announcement um, with your friends last week about Lumen. But just before yeah. we talk about Lumen, could you just talk a little bit about what led up to you launching this new venture? What kind of, uh, not to be too judgmental, but what, like, what limitations or lack out there in the world did you detect? The motivation. That, yeah, the motivation what were your motivations? for launching the new venture? Well, um, 
So over the years, I was sort of haphazardly invited uh, into different uh, scenarios where, however it manifested, I, I was asked to kind of join and collaborate with people. A lot of times I didn't know them and, and to solve either a problem or to create an opportunity. And, you know, these were sometimes business situations or corporate uh, or brand related or, or civic. Um, you know, sometimes they were, you know, either pro bono, pro bono or, or ad hoc sort of experiments. And in every situation, obviously I learned a lot, but I also saw a pervasive theme across all of them, which was um, the, the human design part was actually very light, if non-existent. And what I mean by that is not much context around human emotion. Um, and I'm not just, just talking about morphological or archetypal work. I'm talking about just basic human dynamics, like how to deal with people in a room and how to bring out the best in them. And, and admittedly, I didn't have a lot of experience. I've, I think I've always been a, a, a very observant person, but I didn't know how to activate it because I, just like most people, I, I survived based on my ego and what I was capable of doing and controlling, which didn't always serve me well, of course, but, mm -hmm. but I saw a big gap there. And so over time, I started to open myself up to things more, and I started to attract different people into my life that had these types of skills. And, you know, my personal role was sort of like piecing together where the opportunities actually are. So, for example, you know, I'd, I'd walk into a corporate setting, and they would think it was they were experiencing one type of problem, and I realized there was a whole other set of problems and opportunities that they weren't even looking at in large part because they hadn't asked basic questions or collaborated or co-created or even thought about the world through a different lens, like an emotional lens or even a spiritual lens. Mm -hmm. And so that was really the impetus. And my partners uh, in Lumen, uh, Philip Horvath and Tears of Hollenhorst, had very, very similar sort of arcs of their own and over their life and careers where they saw similar things through different lenses, of course. Mm -hmm. And so by the time we formed Lumen, which means Enlightened Human, uh, the three of us were sitting on a bunch of IP, both proprietary and IP, and a bunch of opportunity and a bunch of people asking us to work with them. And we just, we were all kind of alone. I, I, I've been kind of a solo guy in different ways for, for years, even though I've collaborated with teams and been a part of companies and all that stuff. But, um, you know, I, I, I was sitting on a molehill of, 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 of IP processes and frameworks and technologies and all sorts of stuff that I just hadn't had an opportunity to activate because, you know, I was either investing in companies or building this over here or doing whatever. Um, I mean, there was no regret there, but the opportunity presented itself, basically. Mm -hmm. And I felt that it was probably one of the most important um, converging layers in my work in terms of actually activating the stuff that I'm doing and talking about and wanting to do to create the biggest social change. And I'll, I'll say it flat out. I, I think independent movements to innovate and disrupt are great and they're necessary and they, and they push against systems and they, and they accelerate entropy and all this stuff. But the real change in the world, I believe, is when you go into the nerve center of a large organization and you transform them on a human level. Uh, especially when you think about, um, at least statistically, <clears throat> the fact that corporations in, in aggregate control seven, over 70% 70 of the known resources, human and natural, in the world, among other things. And all of those systems are, in a, are interlinked to the same fiduciary powers. So, you know, and, 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 and I want to I say this with a caveat. This is not about, you know... Um, overturning the system or, or breaking down the superstructure per se. I'm talking about and we're talking about transforming organizations from the inside out because humans are the source and the solution of problems and opportunities. They just mm -hmm. are. And they've been overlooked. They've been relegated to back rooms and, board, and boardrooms and confined to assembly lines and they've been uh, treated like commodities, like cattle. Um, they've, it's, it's led to all sorts of, of, of related, uh, you know, emotional and psychological problems, you know, not to mention esteem issues. And, you know, um, apart from more, more sort of natural factors involved that the world just, you know, evolves and, th and things do break up and systems flat, flatten, if you will, or become more distributive, um, 
I think those superstructures in the form of large organizations are critical to accelerating our advances as a civilization in really positive ways. And I'm dead, I'm hell bent on it. And I don't even listen to the criticism anymore in terms of negative stuff in terms of, well, fuck corporations and fuck institutions and fuck banks. And it's, it's, that's, it's bullshit because I talk to people at, in very high level, very powerful positions that really do want to change things. They just haven't had the opportunity to contemplate and work on the alternatives. And this is about inclusion and unity, in my belief, not separation. Yeah. Um, not re necessarily being reactive, although reactionary elements are certainly involved, as you know, but that's what it's about. So that's what, that's what brought us together. And there were other more specific factors involved, but in a nutshell, that was it. That is it. So and there it is. I mean, this is really interesting. One of the, I've got a question for both yourself and Maria, mm -hmm. because we, we, as you know, we were at Sustainable Brands London last year and we did a presentation, we gave the um, opening plenary session and I don't know if you know Joe Confino, he's um, the executive editor or an executive editor of The Guardian. I know of him, yeah. yeah he, he came on stage afterwards and he asked us what you've presented in holonomics and holonomic thinking which is very close obviously to what um, you're doing at Lumen, he said that's wonderful, sounds fantastic, but how on earth do you introduce these themes to senior executives in, in big organizations. And this is a question that, I don't know about you, but Maria and I get asked this a lot. Um, you have this wonderful vision, but then you have critics saying, oh, it'll never work. No one will ever listen. So I'll ask Maria in a moment, but what do you say to people when they say, oh, this will never work, wonderful vision, but people in, at senior level in organizations they're not interested because we believe they are. Well, I the first thing I say is, how do you define ROI? And even on the on the with the the, the word inserted investment, they stumble on that, and I go, okay. And what about return on intent, uh, interest, uh, inflection, <laughs> <laughs> any number of things? What are you talking about? I said, well, I can show you different uses of data and, and story and and, and that, that, that prove it. Um, there are lots of use cases available. They're not commonly aggregated or talked about, but they exist. Um, um, uh, you know, Poor Economics has them. U10 has them. Good Country Index has them. They exist and, um, and are, are, ever, are ever increasing in their power and, and resonance. And, um, and then it really just boils down to, to two words I like called practical application. Okay, so theory is wonderful, <clears throat> vision is wonderful, um, technology is wonderful, but if you can't apply it, it's useless. And I know that sounds obvious, but I mean, I've been doing work. I've been in. I've been a professional for almost 20 years now. I'm 42, and I'm still seeing massive disconnects in the way people apply information across the board, across industries. It's incredible. It's, it's, it's mind-boggling in its own way because you realize how not just disconnected people are, but disenfranchised from their own relationships to information. I, I talk a lot about this. It's, it's a relationship to information at the core that's the problem. It's not just overload. It's not just, you know, channels and omni-channels and all this stuff. It's a relationship to information. So, so getting back to the executive question, it's, it really boils down to redefining ROI, and I'm not talking about gimmicks like return on interest that social media pundits are throwing around in these, you know, these, these, these speeches of theirs. Uh, because, I, you know, you, get the, you, you sit those guys down and you start pressing them about stuff, they don't know what the fuck they're talking about. So excuse my language, but they don't. And, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm being a little bit abrasive here because I'm kind of tired of all the bullshit in the ecosystem. I just am. Um, and I'm tired of people commodifying terms that are very valuable to our future um, by, ver by just not thinking about the systemic impacts that they have and then gaming them for their own, you know, their own, uh, you know, their own agendas. And this is, this is pervasive in social media spaces, um, less pervasive in big data because you got more people that, that have legitimate chops and know what they're talking about. 
and in content spaces as well. So yeah, practical application, redefining what ROI means, knowing that ROI can mean many different things in many different contexts given a certain situation, which believe it or not a lot of companies and executives don't see. And fundamentally, you know, a lot of conversations I've had with CEOs of us like, like, you know, some pretty big people, they they know that the that the, 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 the jig is up, right? They know that shareholder value doesn't mean anything anymore. They know that ROI and bottom line value is tied to some form of human value, but again, it hasn't been articulated or illuminated with them or for them or created with them. And, you know, one guy said to me recently, and I won't name names because that's just inappropriate, but he said, you know, no one ever asks me questions like, about this kind of thing. They either want something or they want to sell me something or they, you know, they want to prescribe something to me and I get bombarded with stuff and I just, I just want to have a conversation. I, I don't have the answers. I don't think anybody has the answers uh, uh, in and of themselves. And he's absolutely right. He's dead right, and I think the problem with CEO culture or, or C-suite culture overall, at least it's been this way for the last 40 or 50 years, is you don't show your, your warts. You don't show your ass to people. You, you, are, you are not given space to be vulnerable, and you are not given ample opportunity to express the fact that you are uncertain or that you don't know because it's a sign of weakness or perceived that way, and that's a shame because if more companies had leadership like that, the world would be very different right now, as you know. So. Yeah, but it's, uh, so, so uh, yeah. How, would you, how would you answer no, this? No, uh, I, I was just thinking, but we are living in a transition moment yeah. from this reality in which CEOs should know everything and they can't show uncertainty, and etc. But yeah. coming back to the beginning of our conversation about Kevin Grove and the environment that he, makes you be different. Nowadays, the environment around us are showing to these people that uh, there's no more space for this kind of behavior. Right. And they are able to see that the organization is losing a lot with this kind of uh, posture. So the waste of uh, <coughs> lack of communication, lack of dialogue, lack of uh, connection with, real connection with between the employees and the clients, the, the chain, the value chain and etc. The society is, is becoming more and more uh, apparent, 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 apparent. apparent. Yeah. so yeah. they are becoming much more aware about these facts and uh, in fact the, the point that we are is the transition because they became leaders and CEOs doing the they were the, doing what they knew to do, right? And they yes. were promoted along of their lives. They were promoted, so <coughs> the promotion shows. Yeah, you were doing well, and so they became presidents and leaders. So nowadays they said, okay, so I did it. the way I did. I I was able to come where I I am eh, to to this level, but nowadays it's not more this formula, yeah. it's not this way to do things and uh, I think they, there is a crisis in a, in a good sense. Well you and mentioned a critical word which is transition and I, I, I look at the work we do and the work that you do and others in our network doing as transitional, right? It's not just, mm -hmm. it's not transformational necessarily or even disruptive, it's, it's, tra it's transitional. Yeah. Disruptions happen along the way of really aligning value and understanding what it can mean. Um, even market monopolies, if you want, can occur that way. And yeah. I think some of the dogma that disappoints me and that I that I'm fighting up against against places like Silicon Valley, you know, I'm not pointing figures fingers. Is you know, it's you know, this still this idea of market monopolization and domination and, mm -hmm. and yet what you have is a stratification of wealth that serves the means and the, and the interests of a very select few people and it permeates uh, business cultures from the onset because basically what you're saying to someone who's a founder and a CEO of a startup is you gotta go out there and eat what you kill and you gotta dominate and you gotta destroy and this whole notion of never mind the, the culture building part which is almost completely ignored you have 
the market problem, which is you're not actually building and contributing to markets because the only ex ecosystems that really exist are those in which you have a closed circuit of, of people and companies that basically kind of do favors for each other. And that's mm -hmm. fine. That's fine, provided that um, the rest of the world it, is not eating from, from, from peanut shells, which is kind of what's happening right now. So this, this monocultural, monopolistic uh, approach to, to business and, and, and leadership is, is, mm -hmm. is, a, is a virus that needs to be contained and, and squashed. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And we need to look at competition as something that you do um, to push each other over new forms of value. Yeah. Emerging value exactly. systems. Um, it's, it's, you know, Umar Haik talked about this years ago in his books, and he's right. It's, it's competing over value. And that can also, uh, uh, you know, permeate different types of collaboration and co-creation and all sorts of things that you would do once you sort of get a handle on what kind of a culture you want to build in an organization and how you want it to scale and all that stuff. But mm -hmm. at the core of it is, is, is the mythology tied to mm -hmm. this monocultural mythology and it's very, very precarious. And, and I would argue it's, 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 really, it's really crippled us. Yeah, and uh, just to add something, yeah. as we are talking about uh, transition, fundamentally we are talking about language, because okay. we have to create a bridge for people safely uh, cross the the way. So we come back again to the beginning of our conversations about language in a picture, for instance, and how they can communicate. So I think the key point is the language, and this is why storytelling and all these uh, things related to dialogue and how to improve the connection with the others and etc. are so necessary nowadays and are are the 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 adequate adequate, adequate yeah. uh, oh, yeah. tools to <laughs> to do this this movement and to promote this transformation there's yeah. a caveat there's a caveat to, to I, I agree with you wholeheartedly there, but there's a caveat to, to the language element and the language paradigm which I've experienced in group in independent groups um, various ones you know that kind of started online or offline or what have you wonderful people doing wonderful things and we always talked about shared language but the problem was with that is if you're not running the experiments and you're not activating it, in other words, doing stuff, then the, mm -hmm. then the syntax uh, carries yeah. very little resonance and sustainability over time. So as important as developing shared language is, the, the mindset and the desire yeah, and, the, nice. and the capability to experiment is more important now than it's ever been. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. In any in any size organization, for that matter. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I agree. So, I think this is probably the final question. Just looking at the time. Okay. Uh, you, you mentioned the mythology, maybe broken mythologies. But as part when we were um, when I was like putting a link to this hangout on you know social media. Yep. Um, what came up was your fantastic uh, diagram on Lumen which mm. talked about the ordinary world, the customer, and the co-creator and the mm. special world. And again, when I post um, the recording of this Hangout, I'll put a link to this particular diagram. It's a wonderful diagram. I was just wondering if you could just talk us yeah. through it again, to what, what, if you could just talk a little bit more, because it, again, it, for me, it, very, it seems to very much build on the hero's journey yes. and this move from what is the ordinary world, and can you explain your thinking about how you take people into <laughs> this special world? Well, great question. Um, so it, the, the, the funny, the, the, the adaptation of, of the Campbell Hero's Journey, uh, mm -hmm. we, we have adapted to or expanded to the Hero's Journey of Open Design. And what I mean with open design is really more of a nonlinear process or a recurring process that builds upon itself, sort of like uh, you know biological or life systems work, symbiosis works, if you will. Mm -hmm. Campbell, of course, said if you want to change the world, change the metaphor. And in my experience and in my belief, core belief, is that if you want to change businesses, um, change the core culture through action, and and t and transport people. Or not, or allow people, or enable to people to transport from their ordinary, monotonous, uh, you know, mundane routines 
into an exceptional world, a special world, that becomes real for them. Part of that is the, the sort of archetypal and mythological and morphological things that they would do to get there. Um, but the other aspect of it is the, the, the actual experience and design of an experience when an experiment is being run in, a, in an environment with people where they're co-creating, collab collaborating, where they actually see and feel and they develop that extrasensory relationship to information. And so these were just sort of profound revelations for me over the years. And, and there were a number of people that, uh, you know, Brian Clark and Lance Weiler and Lena Srivastava and, and a lot of people, a good number of people, I should say, that, I, that I'm close to and, and respect that, that really kind of amplified this point and showed all of us what that can mean. So the adoption of it was around that. And then in recent years, there were a few things that I was involved in. Uh, you can call them innovation uh, engagements or, or whatever, uh, ranging everything from rebuilding a civic system to building an entire industry ecosystem to doing a very, you know, creating a very specific uh, product set uh, with, a few with a few groups where we would employ the, the open design approach based on Campbell to what we were doing, and, and it worked. Um, I, I, mean, I don't know how to say it in any other way. I, I, got, I got flack from some people, and well, you know, Campbell, it's, it's meant to be a linear process, and I said, well, it can be whatever you want it to be, right? It's just, it's just an adaptation. I had one person say, oh, we, in 1988, we did a, a study at, you know, at X university, and we determined that it was no good for business, and I'm like, based on what? Where's the report? Where's the data? How did you approach it? Like, whatever, you know, it, it, it's, so it's a, it's in a constantly evolving set of things, and it's tied to a bunch of other stuff I've been developing over the years in terms of narratology, narratological approaches, and, and just different forms of, of, of applied storytelling. And the, the takeaway amidst my, my rant is that, that storytelling is a very, very active uh, mechanism for human development, uh, let alone organizational development, probably not whatever, but human development, right? Most people aren't acquainted with their own story, let, let alone their, genealogical, uh, their genealogy or their histories, but, but their active states of being in the environment that they are working in or living in right now. So when you apply these types of techniques, um, it's not just fantasy stuff, it's not nonfiction fi or fictional modalities, although you can use them, it's really about getting the person to see and manifest different realities, to your point, Maria, and to your point. And that's the whole, that's the whole deal. That's, that's why we do it. Fantastic. So that's a really wonderful place to end because just going back to all the amazing experiences we had, we saw uh, the Turner Collection. Um, I know you know Gunter, I'm a, well, we, we're both huge fans of Goethe. Yeah. We finally, well, for me, another huge experience was seeing Turner's study of Goethe, um, Color and Light. That was a huge experience for me. Um, also, we saw a very special exhibition on Sherlock Holmes. Mm, He's yeah. a huge fan of Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. And again, just talking about, just looking at, you know, the different ways in which Sherlock has been observed interpreted. How can yes. you see the reality? All, again, yeah. that was at the um, the Museum of London. The curators there did a wonderful job wonderful. showing exhibits from private collections that haven't been seen before. We, uh, we, got, we got out into nature, we went to York. Yeah. And Lovely. So, yeah. so, so I really feel that a lot of these creators deserve respect. I feel they opened something inside of us that we went a little bit into this special world. Mm -hmm. you know, we, saw, we saw this um, when we were in Paris in December for Le Web, Alexis and I on like the second to last day, I think it was, went to uh, one of the... Um, one of the more niche uh, museums, if you want to call it that, and we saw a wonderful interactive exhibit on the Paris uprising during World War II when they basically oh. ousted the Nazis, which was really interesting. And a really beautiful use of, of long and short form text, uh, uh, film, filmic renditions, uh, all sorts of stuff, to your points. Um, but it really stirred up some new new thinking about history. And, and one other thing I want to mention before we go, which is related uh, in terms of applied storytelling, I, I, I think I've convinced my father to let um, Mark Mazeroski, the former curator of the U.S. Holocaust Museum, and myself and some other people to 
expand his story when he left uh, the Weimar Republic, Nazi Germany, in, in, in 38. Kristallnacht happened in, in November 9, 1938. He was born in 1932, so he was basically six years old. Um, my grandfather, who played goalie for the German national team and won an Iron Cross in World War I, and who was revered by much of the SS, um, was placed into holding camps, and then my grandmother negotiated their release. So they took the Trans-Siberian Railroad across uh, the, the, you know, Siberia, obviously, and parts of Russia, into Shanghai, China, where they lived a very, very interesting life until, of course, that, that, that territory was occupied and the, and the Mao regime came in and they had to leave. So um, my point being is that he's going to tell his story, but we're going we're gonna to expand those narratives into other areas, distending branches, if you will, of other accounts of Holocaust survivors. And what I really want to do, and we'll see where this goes, is I want to connect those stories to similar arcs uh, amongst Christians and Muslim groups around the same time period. The, and the, with the intention of showing how, <clears throat> excuse me, how interlinked our, our, our suffering is and our adversity, but also really just to show that we, we, we've all had similar paths in, in mm -hmm. persecution. And hopefully that'll open up some minds, I hope. So I'm pushing that forward. My dad seems to be a, a, a willing cohort, so fingers crossed please. Um, and I think it'll be very powerful. And what we're going to do on the data side is do something that, that Mark and Eric Steiner from the Spatial History Lab at Stanford uh, formulated a few years ago, which is a beautiful form of emotional mapping, where you basically take uh, bystander testimonies and, you know, all types of archetypes, and you map together and reweave the accounts of those stories. And it really kind of solidifies what happened, but it also presents some new uh, some nuances and new perspective as to what what history what history can mean now, and that's kind of the idea. So, because I, I know um, you've already written one, I think it was you who wrote it, a really fantastic article that actually shows some of their yeah that also yeah. come out. They they yeah. their artistic rendition. So at the end of this um, hangout, I'll put a link to that article because cool. I know people. It, it's you talk a little bit about your. You know, your family's history as well. It's a fantastic yeah. article. So I'll link. Yeah, yeah. My dad's a Holocaust survivor, and my mom is Native American Irish uh, Lutheran. So I, I grew up very confused, to say the least. <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore, though. Not anymore. Yeah. So yeah, thank you very much um, for what for us has been yes. a fantastic conversation. I know as talking usual. as usual. I know talking to our friends. We've got friends who will be watching this in Asia. Yeah. Um, Singapore, in South Africa, Australia, Europe, a few friends in Europe, obviously in the UK. A That's few wonderful. Um, really? Lots in Brazil, quite a few pe people will be watching this in Brazil, Argentina, yeah. and also United States, Canada, and North America as well. I think so, I'm, hello to I think I'm closer to you, watching. just FYI, we, I don't know if you knew this, but we're splitting, we're in Florida, now I'm in Palm Beach, Florida. Uh, different reasons, uh, her work and my work, but um, so we're kind of splitting times. But I think I'm closer to you now from my oh, Absolutely, absolutely. So that, that's good, right? So now I have no excuse not to hop a plane whenever and just come and see you guys. So. Well, you'll yeah. be very welcome well, very soon. Well. So as I say, thank you also thank to you. everyone else who's been watching this. Um, yeah. I hope you've really, um, a lot of this conversation is inspiring. Um, opening up your questioning about Namaste. avenues to explore. Thank you very much. Yeah. It's been wonderful. And until next time. Until <laughs> next time. Peace. Bye. Bye.